share screen. Okay, so can you see um, yes. these notes on the screen? Yes. Okay, so um, what got me involved in this is uh, a few months ago, there was a new biography of von Neumann published by a man named uh, Bhattacharya. And I was, uh, I'm in the process of writing a review of this biography for the American Math Society uh, notices. And, uh, and I thought, which makes perfect sense, I believe, that if you're writing a biography, if you're writing about von Neumann, at least, uh, and you're a mathematician, you should know something about what von Neumann actually did, by which I mean, you know, read a paper or two. And uh, there is a beautiful essay by Freeman Dyson called A Walk Through Johnny von Neumann's Garden. Um, so uh, Freeman Dyson describes von Neumann's fundamental contributions to mathematics, physics, computer science. And then he adds a sort of a remark, in another corner of the garden, there was a little flower all by itself, a short paper that solves a problem raised by the Polish mathematician Hugo Steinhaus. Johnny solved the Steinhaus problem quickly and never returned to it. The theorem that he proved is counterintuitive, and the proof is astonishing. So I thought um, if Dyson wrote that, I should actually read this paper. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So Steinhaus's problem is uh, to partition an interval that is an interval in the real, a finite interval in the real line into countably infinitely many pairwise disjoint sets that are congruent in the set that each set is a translate of a fixed set A. So um, I don't know if Steinhaus ever published the problem. As far as I know, the problem was first stated in 1921 in a paper by Stefan uh, Majakevich, uh, who says, uh, if you don't like the French, um, one can, uh, decompose the line into infinitely many, countably infinitely many non-measurable sets, pairwise disjoint. Um, Steinhaus uh, remarked that we don't know if it's possible to, to solve the problem of uh, an analogous decomposition of a segment, for example, the unit interval. So the Steinhaus question is, can you take this closed unit interval and partition it into countably infinitely many pairwise disjoint sets um, that are congruent in the sense that each is a translate of the other. Um, so that's the Steinhaus problem. And this is the problem that von Neumann uh, solved. Uh, I should point out, if you take the interval from zero to one, then this may have been another problem of Steinhaus. Can you actually decompose it into a finite number greater than one? two or more pairwise disjoint pieces that are congruent to each other. And that problem is solved, but it was unsolved for a very long time. Uh, I mean, it, you see, if you take a half open interval, the solution is trivial. But if you take the closed interval or the open interval, it's not at all trivial. Uh, but Steinhaus's problem was to partition an interval into countably infinitely many congruent pieces, pairwise disjoint congruent pieces. Now you can ask, what is an interval? And there are four kinds of intervals. You can have an open interval, you can have a half open, half closed interval, or a closed interval. For partitions into a finite number of pieces, the half open, half closed intervals have trivial positive solutions. Um, for the open and the closed intervals, uh, it's not so obvious. So, and what von Neumann did is he solved, he solved the Steinhaus problem for all types, for all four types of intervals, right? It doesn't matter which type of interval you take. Um, so for every interval I, von Neumann proved the existence of a set A and a sequence, a countably infinite sequence of real numbers such that this set of translates of A, these sets are, so they're congruent because each is a translate of each other, 
uh, are pairwise disjoint and the interval is the disjoint union of this set of translates. And uh, it's, uh, so it follows, for example, that the set A is necessarily a non-measurable set because uh, if A were measurable, if it had measure zero, the union would have zero measure. If it had positive measure, the union would have infinite measure. So A has to be a non-measurable set. Um, and so I want to describe von Neumann's proof and also extend it from intervals in R to parallel pipettes in Rn. Um, Smell is the construction effective? Exactly the same size, just up to limit. Uh, is it effective? Uh, first of all, so the answer is no. Um, and um, I'll say something about that in a second, but, but I, I don't mean, think there is without, any effective construction of a non-measurable set. Without the axiom of choice, I mean, you can have a, a axiom system where every set is measurable. Right, I'm about and, to mention that. And okay. Okay. I, I don't understand what the set A is doing here because instead of saying of a bunch of men that they're all the same height as each other, I could say they're all the same height as Mel Nathanson, but Mel Nathanson is superfluous in that case. Well, so you can, so you can state this result in several equivalent ways. One is that exactly as I stated it, there's a fixed set A an accountably infinite number of translates of A, such that the translates are pairwise disjoint and their union is the interval. Alternatively, you can say you can partition the interval I into countably infinitely many pieces and each piece is a translate of every other piece. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly the same thing. Okay, now one can coincidentally restate this problem in the language of additive number theory. So um, in general, if you have an additive semigroup and take subsets A, B, and C, we know the sum set A plus B is everything that is the sum of an element of A and an element of B. And the set C is the sum of the sets A and B if A plus B equals C. We, said C, we say that C is the direct sum of A and B if A plus B equals C, and every element in C has a unique representation as the sum of an element in A and an element in B. Um, and so you have the following sort of trivial identity. Suppose C is A plus B, it's a sum set. So you can write that as a sum of translates of A. It's the union of A plus little b over all elements of the set B. And you can also write it as the sum as the union of translates of B. It's, it's, uh, it's all elements of A, it's, it's B translated by all elements of A. So these sets are all congruent to each other. They're all congruent to A. And these sets are all congruent uh, to each other. Uh -huh. And uh, this is useful from the following point of view. If C is the union of countably infinitely many congruent sets, so, Let's say that B is a countably infinite set. So here, A plus B is a union of countably infinitely many sets. But if and only if C is also the union of an arbitrary number of sets, uh, which are all congruent to some set B, which is, con which is countably infinite, right? So you can either say that C is the sum of countably many uncountable sets, or the union of uncountably many countable sets. Um, and we'll, and von Neumann, in, without using this language, makes exactly this observation. And it is the, one of the key parts of his proof. Um, so, so we get an equivalent forms of Steinhaus's problem. The original problem is to prove that every interval was the union of a countably infinite number of pairwise disjoint congruent sets. Uh, alternatively, prove that every interval is the union of uncountably many pairwise disjoint sets, each of which is congruent to a fixed countably infinite set. I mean, it's just, all right. And this is something that I don't need yet, so skip that. Now, one of the things I learned after spending a lot of time trying to understand von Neumann's paper and being completely impressed by how out of nowhere he has this idea 
of um, using the axiom of choice to construct a set, which is basically a set of coset representatives of a certain group. Um, and then I uh, somehow looked up um, what may be the first construction, in quotes, construction of a non-measurable set, which was due to Vitali. So Lebeg was doing his work on measure theory at the very beginning of the 20th century. I mean, his earliest papers, the papers that I saw were from 1902, 1903. And in 1905, Giuseppe Vitali proved that there exist sets of real numbers that are not measurable with respect to any normalized translation invariant measures on omega. So omega is just a sigma algebra that contains all of, on the line that contains all the intervals. So it contains all the Borel sets. And normalized means that the measure of an interval is the length of an interval, of the interval. And uh, translation invariant means that if you take a set A and translate it by B, the measure of A plus B is the same as the measure of A. So with respect to any normalized translation invariant measure, uh, Vitali uh, proved that there exists a non-measurable set. And in his proof, he uses the axiom of choice to construct a set of coset representatives of a quotient group. And von Neumann uses this idea in his proof. So um, just very quickly, I want to sort of sketch what Vitali did. And, you know, in retrospect, it's very simple, but, you know, you have to be brilliant to come up with a simple idea. So, um, so you take the rational numbers, that's a subgroup of the real numbers as an additive group, you take the quotient group. And um, the set Q, the rationals, you know, are dense in R. And so if you translate Q, that is if you take any coset X plus Q, that's also dense in R. So in particular, every coset intersects the unit interval. So by the axiom of choice, the only reason I'm saying the axiom of choice is as Moshe said, it turns out that the existence of non-measurable sets is essentially equivalent to the axiom of choice. So using the axiom of choice, and it, uh, you construct what is called a Vitali set by choosing uh, an element from the intersection of each coset of, of uh, in R mod Q with the unit interval. So this Vitali set is a subset that contains exactly one element V of X from each coset X plus Q. Well, so yeah, it's a subset of zero one that contains exactly one element from each coset X plus Q. And Vitali's theorem is that every Vitali set fails to be measurable with respect to every, every normalized invariant measure. Um, so I'm sure, I assume that um, sometime a uh, hundred years ago or so when I was learning measure theory, it probably included Vitali's proof, um, but, um, but I couldn't find it in Halmosh's book on measure theory, for example. So there's a very quick proof of Vitali's theorem. Um, if you look at all the rationals in the interval from minus one to one, that's, I mean, the rationals are countably infinite. So this intersection is countably infinite. And I can enumerate the elements, Q1, Q2, Q3, and so forth. Um, okay, so I have this enumeration of the rationals between minus one and plus one. And I take a Vitali set, that is, a, cos a set of coset representatives in the unit interval. Um, and the first thing is to show that if I translate the Vitali set by one of these rational numbers, I get infinitely many pairwise disjoint sets. So let's see, why is that? So if you have V plus QI and V plus QJ that have a point in common, then they're real numbers X and Y, such that V of X plus QI, that's something in this set, is equal to V of Y plus QJ, something in this set. So V of X minus V of Y is QJ minus QI, that's rational. And if the difference is rational, then these two numbers belong to the same coset, so they have to be equal because we only have one coset representative from each coset. So these translated sets, 
V plus Q sub I gives us a countably infinite set of pairwise disjoint and obviously congruent subsets of the reals. So now we do some baby arithmetic. If V is in the Vitali set, it's between zero and one. If Q sub I is in this set, it's between minus one and plus one. So if you add them, V of X plus QI is some number between minus one and two. So if you take the union of all these sets, V plus QI, they're all contained in the interval from minus one to two. So this union is contained in the interval from minus one to two, right? Uh, on the other hand, um, if you take any real number x in the interval and its coset representative v of x, so we have two points between zero and one. So the difference is between minus one and plus one. And moreover, x minus v of x, well, the two, uh, yeah, x and v of x is a coset representative of x. They belong to the same coset. So the difference is rational. So x minus v of x is equal to some rational number. And we know that it's between minus one and plus one. So x minus v of x is equal to one of these numbers q sub i. So x is v of x plus qi. This should be a lowercase i is in, in here, which means what was x? x was yeah. any number in the unit interval, right? So the whole unit interval was contained in this union. So what I have is this union contains the unit interval and it's contained in an interval of length at most three. So if mu were a normalized translation invariant measure, and if the set V were measurable, then each of these sets has the same measure mu of V. And one, which is the measure of the unit interval, because the measure is normalized, is less than or equal to this. These are pairwise disjoint sets which is this, which is less than or equal to three. And this inequality is impossible because if V had measure zero, you'd have zero is between one and three. And if V had measure positive, this would be infinite. So that is Vitali's proof, right? I mean, um, it's beautiful, right? <coughs> and uh, so that I assume was um, one of the key things that von Neumann knew when he was trying to solve his Steinhaus problem. By the way, as Moshe mentioned, uh, Robert Solovey uh, constructed a model of zermelo frankel set theory without the axiom of choice, but with something called an inaccessible cardinal, and it has to have an inaccessible, uncountable cardinal. <laughs> and in this model, every set of real numbers is Lebesgue measurable. So in this sense, the axiom of choice is equivalent uh, to the existence of non Lebesgue measurable sets. An inaccessible cardinal just means a cardinal number that you can't get from smaller cardinals by adding, multiplying, or exponentiating. So, for example, Aleph naught is an inaccessible cardinal because you can't get Aleph naught by adding, multiplying, or exponentiating uh, uh, finite cardinals. Right? So, that's solid base there. Okay. So now I want to sketch the von Neumann's proof, his solution of Steinhaus's problem. And um, so von Neumann used Vitali's idea of applying the axiom of choice uh, to the intersection of an interval I with the cosets of some countably infinite dense subgroup of R. Now, the rational numbers this, the set of rational numbers is a countably infinite dense subgroup of R. Von Neumann constructs a different countably infinite dense subgroup. So the key to the proof is the following construction of a countably infinite set B of Q independent real numbers. That is, the set B of real numbers is literally independent over the rationals. And among other things, this set B will have exactly two accumulation points, right? Uh -huh. Two points that are uh, limits of sequences of other elements of the set. Um, and the way it's done in general is the following. Suppose I take real numbers 
beta naught, beta one, and delta. Delta is positive. So beta naught plus delta is less than beta one minus delta, right? So delta is less than uh, the difference than the than beta one minus, anyway. Beta naught is less than beta one and you choose delta such that beta naught plus delta is less than beta one minus delta. So there exists a countably infinite set of real numbers such that the set B, this countably infinite set is linearly independent over Q. And the numbers satisfy the following. First of all, B naught is between beta zero and beta zero plus delta. And for every even number, B naught, B2, B4, like they're all between B naught and beta, between B naught, between B naught and beta naught plus delta. And the limit of the sequence of the even terms of the Bs is B naught. Similarly, I choose B1 between beta one minus delta and beta one. And all the other odd terms in this set are going to be strictly less than B1 and bigger than beta one minus delta. And the limit of these odd terms will be B1, okay? So I wanna construct such a set. And there's an extremely simple way to do it if you're clever. I mean, you know, uh, after the fact, everything is clear, but to think it up is not so obvious. So uh, this is essentially what von Neumann did. He said, take any set sequence of numbers, countably infinite set of real numbers that are literally independent over Q. So for example, if you take theta to be pi or E or any transcendental real number, then the set of powers of theta, one theta theta, this is literally independent over Q. That's what transcendental means. It means that the theta doesn't solve any algebraic uh, equation. Actually, all von Neumann did was just take the powers of E, but again, you can take any transcendental number. All you need to know is that there is such a set. So these are Q independent, independent over the rationals. And, if you take any sequence whatsoever of non-zero rational numbers and you multiply the terms of this sequence by this sequence, so you look at Q0, C0, Q1, C1, Q2, C, this, this new set will also be independent over Q because the Qs are rational, no matter, no matter what rational numbers you choose. So, right. so how do we choose the rational numbers? So I want a number B naught between beta naught and beta naught plus delta. So you just find some rational Q naught. So Q naught times C naught falls in that interval. And you just find some rational Q1 such that Q1 C1 falls in this upper interval, right? And just to make it easy, suppose you have some number delta prime such that B naught plus delta prime is between B naught and B naught plus delta. And similarly, um, B one minus delta prime. And I just multiply my, the numbers in this sequence of C's by appropriate rationals. So each B n, so each B two n satisfies this kind of inequality. And each of the odd numbers satisfies this inequality. And all I've done is multiply the C's by rational. So my B sequence is Q independent. And just the way from looking at this inequality, you see that the even numbers in the sequence converge to B naught and the odd numbers in the sequence converge to B one. That's the whole proof, okay? And von Neumann actually does this only in the following special case, which, what he, which is what he needs. So for any, so this is his, his construction really. If you take any epsilon greater than zero, there's a countably infinite set of real numbers that are linearly independent over Q. The uh, even numbers are between minus two epsilon and minus epsilon. So they're negative. The odd numbers are between epsilon and two epsilon. And the evens converge down to B naught and the odds converge up to B one. So we take that set B. So that's just a set of numbers. And now we take the subgroup G that is generated by the sequence of Bs. 
So that means all integral linear combinations of the Bs. So B is countable, so this group is countable. And um, they teach you in beginning number theory that if you take any irrational number theta, its multiples are uh, dense mod one, which is equivalent to the statement, uh, essentially, that if you take any irrational number uh, theta, that the numbers of the form m, m plus n theta are dense on the real line. Uh, so this uh, and yeah, so this subgroup G is not only countably infinite, but it is also dense in R. Okay. Um, yeah, that's all that says. Okay. All right. Now, so this is von Neumann's theorem. Every finite interval is the union of countably infinitely many pairwise disjoint congruent sets. And again, by finite interval, I mean finite interval, any one of the four types of intervals, open, closed, half open, half closed, and so forth. Okay. So take a finite interval. So let C naught be the inf and C1 the soup of the interval. <laughs> so C naught and C1 may or may not be contained in I, it doesn't matter. And um, the length of the interval in any case is C1 minus C0. And choose an epsilon that is uh, less than positive epsilon, which is less than C1 minus C0 over eight. It just turns out to be convenient. And for this epsilon, I take this set B I constructed on the previous slide. So this is a set of numbers uh, with exactly two accumulation points. Uh, one is B naught, which is between minus two epsilon and minus epsilon. The other, which is positive, is between epsilon and two epsilon. And I let G or G of epsilon be the countably infinite dense subgroup that this set B generates, right? And again, if you have a dense subgroup and you translate it, a dense subset and you translate it, you get another dense subset. So every coset of this subgroup G um, is also countably infinite and dense. And in particular, it follows that every coset intersects the interval i. Right. So using the axiom of choice, um, I only keep saying this because first of all, um, back in the beginning of the 20th century, people like to point out when they were using the axiom of choice. So Vitali and von Neumann always emphasize the fact that they're using the axiom of choice at this point. Uh, we take a set V, which will be coset representatives of uh, the group R mod G. Um, uh, in fact, uh, yeah, I don't even have to take them in the interval I. I just take V to be any set of coset representatives of the reals modulo of the subgroup. So for every X uh, in R, there's an element, a unique element V, such that a V is an X plus G. And it's obviously uncountable because uh, I'm taking a union of countable sets and getting an uncountable set. I mean, it doesn't really matter. So now, okay. So here is like a key point. For every V in this set of COSEP representatives, um, I can, I can write my interval i as v plus j, or I should have written this j sub v. Um, so j v is just, so j is just i translated by minus v, right? So j is just another interval of exactly the same length. And if I look at i intersect the coset v plus j, that's i is, v plus j sub v is this intersection, which is v plus the intersection of this interval with g. And the cosets r minus r mod g partition r. Um, so I have that i, it's the, so the cosets partition the line. So if I look at the intersection of the cosets with i, the union over all the cosets is i. And I only need to take each coset once. So I can just take 
the union of I intersected with the coset V plus G, where V is in this set of coset representatives. And <clears throat> I can write um, I plus V intersect J is just V plus J sub V inter intersect G. It's just, mm -hmm. so my set I is a union of translates by V of an interval of the same length as I intersected with G. And okay, so I just really want to emphasize this. This is like the, the T observation. So my I is a union of these sets, and these sets are pairwise disjoint. And it's a translate of this set I, which is the intersection of some interval with my subgroup G, right? That's what we have. Now, suppose, suppose that for every interval J of length, I can write V minus I, but this is, this is, this is the length of I. Um, Suppose I can write G intersect J in the form A plus V for some set A, some set A. Uh, so what this means is that uh, then for every V, there's a set A sub V, so that J V intersect G is some set plus this set B. And remember B is this countably infinite set I constructed, it depends on epsilon. And let A be this set. V plus A sub V, take A V, translate it by V, take the union of all these things. So I is equal to this. J intersect G is this sum, which I can write like this, which I, which is this. And these sets are disjoint. So this is really a direct sum decomposition. So I is A direct sum with B. I is the union of uncountably many, but doesn't matter, some number of translates of this countably infinite set B. And that's exactly what I said was all I needed to do, or all von Neumann did, to solve the Steinhaus problem. So the problem reduces to showing that if you take any interval J of this fixed length, uh, whatever it is, B minus A or C1 minus C0, uh, that J intersect G can be decomposed into the sum of a set A, some A plus B. Right? That's what Steinhaus's problem reduces to. <clears throat> so this stated here again. So Steinhaus's problem uh, comes down to this, prove that for every interval J, and every epsilon such that eight epsilon is between zero and the length of J or epsilon is less than the length of J over eight, there's a set A such that J intersect G is A plus B where uh, G or B is the set with the two accumulation points and G is the subgroup that the set B generates. Right. Now, okay. So we haven't done anything hard yet. And uh, I'm not sure that there's anything that is so hard in the proof, really, but you know, after it's been done. But in order to prove this, it's going to be a kind of a proof by induction. You see that G is countable, right? G is a subgroup generated by a countably infinite set. So the intersection of J and G is going to be some countably infinite set. This is a countably infinite set. Okay. So if you have a countably infinite set, you can often do things by induction. And that's what it's going to reduce to. So the, the, the key part of the proof is buried in this lemma. So the lemma says the following. If you have a finite interval J, uh, C naught is the inf and C1 is the soup. And if you... <coughs> And you take any x in the open interval from C0 to C1 intersected with G. Right? 
and you choose an epsilon between zero and the length of j over eight, right? Eight epsilon is this. And you let b be the, that sequence you construct from the epsilon with the two accumulation points. So this is what the lemma says. You have to sort of think about this perhaps a tiny bit. If you take k real numbers such that, so this is this number x. x is something in this interval intersected with g. So suppose I take k translates of b and x is not in any one of them. So x is not in this union. So then two things, I can say two things are possible. There are infinitely many numbers A, such that X is in some translate of B by A, and that whole translate is contained in J intersect G on the one hand. And on the other, this translate of B is disjoint from all of these translates. All right? So I have K translates of B. It doesn't contain some element X, which is in this set I'm interested in. And I can find a whole translate of B that is disjoint from all of these sets and contains X. So, uh, I mean, I actually have here, and hopefully in a day or two, I will just post this on archive or send it to anyone who's interested, the proof of this, because this proof takes a tiny bit of work. So what we're going to show is that this condition, that there are uh, holes for infinitely many A. So the first thing is to show there are infinitely many numbers A, such that the translate A plus B is completely contained in this and contains X. But of course, some of these translates might intersect one of these sets A, I plus B. Um, and, but I wanna show that in fact, there are infinitely many numbers A, for which A plus B, in fact, does not intersect any one of these sets. So first we're going to prove that this condition, equation five holds for infinitely many A. And second, that if we add the additional condition that A plus B is disjoint from all of these translates, that excludes only finitely many A's for which this condition is satisfied. And since this holds for infinitely many A's, if you throw out any finite, finite number, there's still infinitely many left. So, yeah, maybe I'll just skip the proof. I mean, proofs are, I don't like proofs. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so make believe that I prove that, all right? I mean, that's the only maybe hard part of the proof, but technical things and talks don't make a lot of sense. So, how do you finish von Neumann's proof given that fact? So let me just go back to this lemma and explain um, what's going to happen. So I wanna show that this whole interval intersected, that this whole interval intersected, that this, sorry, I wanna show this whole interval is, um, a union of disjoint translates of this set B. So suppose I have, but this interval, but this, this is countable, right? Because G is countable. So there are only countably many numbers in this set. So suppose uh, I have um, AI plus B. These are subsets of this interval, a finite number of them. And um, Not everything is in there, of course. Um, so suppose I take a number X, which is in here, but not in this union. So I want to take another translate. I want to show there's another translate of B, which contains X, is contained in this intersection, and is disjoint from all these other sets. Well, my, this lemma says I can do that. That basically is the whole sort of proof by induction. Um, take this union, uh, find the smallest in this enumeration of this countably infinite set, find the one with the smallest index, which hasn't appeared, which doesn't appear in this finite union, 
And then you can find a, a, um, a translate of B that uh, contains the X and it's disjoint from these. So we add it to the collection. And you do this countably infinitely many times and you've covered the set. Wow, that's von Neumann's proof, modulo the hard part. Um, yeah, that's really all I need to say about that. Um, by the way, you can now extend the Steinhaus problem to parallel pipeds because every parallel piped um, so you can, is uh, a product of intervals open, closed, or half open, half closed. Uh, so we know that every interval is the union of countably infinitely many pairwise disjoint congruent sets. Um, so by the sort of purely additive number theoretical lemma I mentioned earlier, uh, if you have uh, uh, a direct sum, of, if a set is a direct sum of two other sets, if you take the product of those sets, you get a you get another direct sum. That's that's exactly all, all you need to know to to extend uh, the Steinhaus problem to uh, uh, parallel pipettes. Um, now, in geometry, this uh, has led to, um, as is always the case, um, an infinite literature uh, on what are called N decompositions. So in general, if you have a group G that acts on a set X, uh, we say that subsets A and A prime are G equivalent or G congruent or congruent with respect to the group and denoted A prime squiggles A. If sigma of A equals A prime for some uh, motion, some transformation in the group. So if Y is a subset of X and G is acting on X, you let M be a finite or infinite cardinal. What is called an M decomposition of Y is a partition of Y into M, should be both A's, M, pairwise disjoint subsets. Um, so where each, where these sets A sub J are all congruent to each other. So this is an M decomposition. So for example, the group Q acts on um, R, by translation, x goes to x plus b. And for every positive integer m, uh, this is an m decomposition of the half closed, half open interval. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, uh, for a long time, it was an open problem to determine if either the open interval or the closed interval had an m decomposition for every integer or some integer m greater than or equal to two. So this went back again to about the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, in 1951, someone named Gustin proved that fi such finite decompositions do not exist. Um, let me just make one last remark. So Freeman Dyson obviously loved this paper of von Neumann, uh, but the paper elicited some curious comments. So um, in a paper in the 1950s, that extended von Neumann's result to empty compositions of an interval for any cardinal number A between Aleph naught and two to the Aleph naught. Of course, there may not be any, right? I mean, or at least it depends on what model of set theory you're using. But Michelski wrote, uh, the idea of his proof is the same as von Neumann's, but uh, his proof is simplified. And then Stan Weigand, who wrote a survey paper on the subject, also repeated Michelski's uh, assertion that uh, he gave a simplified proof. For me, I found Michelski's proof very complicated, uh, much harder than von Neumann's. Um, so maybe this is just a question of taste. Now, Paul Hamosh, who had been von Neumann's assistant at the Institute for Advanced Study long ago, um, he did not share Dyson's enthusiasm for this paper of von Neumann. Uh, he wrote in a survey um, the question of Steinhaus's problem is of a technical gymnastic kind, and von Neumann's positive answer uses the set theoretic and epsilontic trickery appropriate to this domain, which is uh, obviously a put down. Nonetheless, 
Hamos concludes a survey of von Neumann's contributions to measure an, an ergodic theory as follows. In quantity, these contributions amount roughly to one-tenth of von Neumann's scientific publications. As to their quality, it seems safe to say that if von Neumann had never done anything else, they would have been sufficient to guarantee him mathematical immortality. Um, uh, oh, this is just the proof of the density theorem. And, yeah. And here are um, references for anyone who might be interested. And that is all I am going to say. So I thank you for your attention. Mel. Yes. Uh, are you posting this on archive or if not, would you email me a copy of it? Uh, so the answer is probably yes to both questions. But given the fact that I forgot to say I was meeting at, uh, in person at the Graduate Center today, uh, I would uh, encourage you to send me an email to remind me that I should send you a copy. All right, well, I'm doing it now. Thanks, Mel. Okay. Good. We're done. Comments? Oh, yeah. yes. All right, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I would just want to have a remark. Um, it reminded me the when I took uh, uh, measure theory, I asked the and the professor um, built a, a, a non-measurable set. I asked him a question that he didn't know to answer on the point. Uh, at the moment, what is the external measure of this set? Yes. But uh, 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 instead, I will think about it and um, I'll tell you pro hopefully next time. But if it comes to, to the von Neumann's construction, I assume that the external measure of the set must be zero. No, no, no. The exterior, the uh, the interior measure is zero, is is zero, but the exterior measure is strictly positive. It's strictly positive, but yes. uh, you 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 add up a, a countable, which is infinite number of positive numbers, which yeah, but it's not the measure. Oh, oh, I see the measure. Oh, it is strictly positive. The ex. Um, there's like interior measure and exterior measure, right? Yeah, 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 inner yeah. measure, outer measure. The inner measure is zero. The outer measure, uh, I believe is, I'm um, sure, is strictly positive. Strictly positive? Yes. But it's not yeah. countably additive, so it doesn't contradict anything about the finiteness of the interval you're covering. Yeah, okay. Oh, and the, and the internal measure, uh, measure, measure is zero? Yeah. Yeah, I guess okay. that shows it's not measurable. <laughs> Sorry? I guess that shows that the set cannot be measurable. Oh, no, it's definitely not measurable. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned it, yeah. 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 No, so this can be a, a good example uh, for a class that you teach uh, that the, um, the outer measure and the inner measure are distinct. Yeah, but the same is true for the Vitali set, which is much easier to work with. That has yeah. inner measure zero and outer measure positive. Yeah, but I'm today far away from measure theory, yeah. It, mm -hmm. um, it was, um, it was a, a required course back in my days as an undergraduate to take measure theory and and uh, and uh, computer science was a part of the mathematics, and the computer sciences scientists ma uh, made a rebellion and a strike that they don't want to take measure theory. Yeah, this was in the old days in the yeah. 19, 1970. Yeah. yeah. Before computer science was a discipline. It was, it was, yeah, before it was a discipline, yeah. yeah. Henrik, did you have a question? 
Or gone? Yeah. Um, oh. I, I, I raised my hand by mistake. Oh, okay. I have tons of questions, but you wouldn't like to listen. <laughs> Another time. Okay. okay. Yeah. Whenever. Did we discuss Yitang Zhang's newest paper in the Shmoo session? No. Uh, David yeah. Ross is getting his hand up like crazy. He's waving, <laughs> doing jumping jack stuff. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, David, <laughs> when I was looking at this the first time, I thought this was clearly something which um, some, uh, you know, ultra product filter or whatever uh, would be able to deal with more easily. Yeah, well, that I don't know. And, and the reason it looks like I'm asking like crazy is I'm, my hand is like right in front of the webcam here. Um, no, it, it's possible. There are some, there are some clever ways of constructing non-measurable non -measurable sets by decomposing the, the interval using, using ultra filters, but they're equivalent to, to uh, stuff you can do with non-standard analysis, uh, like, like taking infinite um, uh, decimal representations of numbers and taking all the ones whose hth digit is seven where H is an infinite integer. That's that's a that's a, um, a non-measurable set. But anyway, that's not what I wanted to ask. There there was a monograph. Serpinski gave some lectures in India in the 1950s, and they were collected into a monograph, uh, which the AMS published in like 1958, 1959. And unfortunately. I'm at home, so I don't. I couldn't reach to behind me and find it. And even though it's in the office, I think it's buried under a mountain of books right now. Um, but I was curious whether, because it's a real, the book is a compendium of this kind of result. Yeah, um, so I the, I saw a reference to it, and I saw also that it was reprinted by Dover Publications around 1950, 51. But um, well, the AMS actually had a series, and the AMS published a, a monograph which included that one. It included something by by Klein. Mm -hmm. uh, it was four four author four different monographs by four different. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was one of them. Yeah. So I had meant if I had gone to the graduate center today to look in the library to see if it were there, but um, uh, since I never I mean, leave my house, if you haven't seen it before, I, I warn you that if you pick this thing up and start to read it. You will lose a chunk of your life because it's 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 beautifully written, and it just contains one neat result after another of of this kind of variety. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, but I was just curious whether you knew offhand whether whether this particular result. Yeah, was... I haven't seen it. I know that there is still a lot of work being done on these uh, finite decomposition of spheres, and um, uh, there's actually even a paper by one of our colleagues, uh, Dennis Sullivan with Pierre Deline uh, on uh, decomposing a sphere into pieces. But uh, this uses a little bit more uh, than the baby stuff I was talking about today. But I do think it was interesting that Deline and Sullivan at some point were interested in this and enough to write a paper on it. Maybe. Mel, yes. Do you know this book? Uh, no. Who's the author? I can't read it. Yeah, Steinhaus. Right. Steinhaus. Steinhaus. Yeah, there are many more problems here. Well. <laughs> Oh, well, this is this is in okay. Polish. Oh, I, was, I was like watching TV. I didn't want them to hear me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. This yeah. is this book in in Polish. Yes, in the, okay. in, in good Polish. Uh, <laughs> uh, now I cannot see. Uh, I can see only mathematicznie, um, but the first two word is kaleidoscope. Yeah, kaleidoscope. Yeah, kaleidoscope. Oh. Mathematical kaleidoscope. And, and what is who is the author? Hugo Steinhaus. Oh, Steinhaus. The hero of today's talk. Yeah. Oh. So evidently, is it, is it possible to get this book somehow? I don't know. My my wife found it uh, between uh, books in old uh, shelves just a few days ago. I even don't know what where it came. I mean, how I got that. This is I, I didn't read it. You know. 
but, but uh, there are lots of problems like this, you know, over there. Lots yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know Steinhaus school, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he, he has a book that's been translated to English, A Hundred Problems in Elementary Mathematics. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if it's... this has something in common. I mean, there is, the, 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 the title is different. I mean, yeah. the one that everybody knows in English is Mathematical Snapshots, yeah. but, um, right. but that would be different from this. Yeah. No problem. So the, the Steinhaus problem that Mel was talking today is not in the book. Yeah, and as, as I said, I, I don't know if you ever published it. It was in this uh, paper by Morzikiewicz. Uh, but he said, this is a problem of Steinhaus. So I had read somewhere that Steinhaus somehow managed to survive in Poland under the German occupation by teaching mathematics secretly to people. Really? Oh, I didn't know And that, that somehow uh, he was in that way responsible for keeping alive the Polish mathematical school, um, hmm. notwithstanding all the people who either uh, emigrated uh, or were killed. Uh, in which period we are talking about, Mel? Sorry? Which period you are talking during about? During World War II, during the German occupation. Uh -huh, okay, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I was fortunate to meet him once, personally, when I was very, very little kid. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he also wrote a nice, beautiful limericks or, or a little bit, uh, you know, uh, how to say, I would say limericks, yeah. Yeah, just, uh, he was easygoing, you know, writing things and talking about mathematics in, for general public. Besides, of course, his uh, very good research work from, you know, from, from, from the both right period yeah you, you know his best uh, mathematical achievement right what Malach Steinhaus yeah exactly yeah but uh, also yeah uh, uh, I think he he used to say that his best achievement was Stefan Banach <laughs> was he Banach's teacher uh, no he Banach was a little young man sitting on a bench somewhere talking oh, to yes. him and talking and, and uh, Steinhaus was passing by and he heard the word Lebec measure. That was really shocking for him. So he he stopped and asked the names and that's how it started. Yeah. There is no alcohol involved. <laughs> Yeah. Mel, I, I got to ask a question that may be uh, out of context, but the uh, result that you mentioned by Sullivan and the Ligne, uh, I'm, I'm wondering what would follow from your result in two dimensions uh, and the fact that the sphere uh, in a spherical coordinates, you can basically parameterize the points by uh, points on a square. Uh, by altitude and by uh, uh, latitude. And uh, so I'm wondering, I mean, you take, you, you parameterize the sphere by, uh, by the points on the square, and then you perform uh, the two-dimensional construction on, uh, the, on the square. And I'm wondering where that implies uh, what uh, Sullivan and the Ligne did. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen this, uh, the composition, but. I mean, yeah, I, I, I this mean, out I think of context, they were looking at higher dimensional spheres, but I can send you their paper. I, I'd, I'd be glad to. I mean, but, it's the situation like on the circle. Yeah. I, I mean, the circle looks like the image of an interval. So the things that you do on the interval, uh, so the, there is a corresponding statement for yeah. the circle. So, but I, yeah, it would be interesting seeing, yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah. But uh, as you might guess, they use a, um, um, a non-trivial bit of uh, uh, number theory or arithmetic geometry kind of stuff uh, in what they're doing. It's not just, you know, uh, it's not the mathematics of the 1920s. <laughs> yeah. Other questions or comments? A question, Mel. Go ahead. You, you know Jan Michelski personally, right? 
Who? Jan Michielski. I know him by name. I do not think I've ever met him. Uh huh. Okay. He's old, old man now, but yes, he is. Yeah, <laughs> he's one of those Polish folks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, remember uh, earlier in the year, last year, I talked about a problem he submitted to the monthly, and. Yeah. Uh, um, so you you said that his proof is, is is more complicated than von Neumann. Oh, his, his yes, I think so. Uh, yes. Do you have um, guts to tell him? Sorry. Do you have guts to tell him? I would have no hesitation to tell him, but yeah. you know, I don't. I mean, uh, he wrote his paper goes back to the nineteen fifties, the one I'm talking, the one that was referred to, um, and. Uh, 1957, uh, in fact. Oh. So, um, and he had written several papers on these finite decompositions of uh, geometrical objects, intervals, spheres, uh, circles, and so forth. Uh, but he was looking at, um, but these are really papers in set theory because he's decomposing things into infinite cardinals greater than all of naught. Uh, but like the, was, sort of strange to me, who's not a set theory guy at all, is that he proves a theorem for cardinal numbers between Aleph naught and two to the Aleph naught. And um, we used to think that there was no cardinal number between Aleph naught and two to the Aleph naught. So uh, and it has to be strictly less than two to the Aleph naught because you can decompose anything into singletons, uh, any, you know, anything that's you know like any interval. So it has to be a cardinal number strictly between Aleph naught and truly Aleph naught. And um, he, he demolished uh, Paul Cohen. Why? Oh, certainly, yeah, well, long before Paul Cohen. Yeah, and it's like I the mean, 1950s. Can, and Paul you Cohen. Can assume, yeah, you okay. can assume that such cardinals exist and work with that, right? You can, but. You pick, you pick your axioms here. Yeah, but why? You get interesting math, Matt. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a natural <laughs> axiom in the theory of infinite games, which implies that there's exactly one cardinal between uh, aleph zero and two to the aleph zero. You know, some natural axiom. By the way, there's a paper in an article in the current issue of the notices on quantum coin flipping, and I could not understand the first paragraph or two. So. Uh, uh, if anyone ever can figure it out, I'd be curious to know. Uh, By the way, there is a paper related to that in your talk. There's a paper in the monthly, um, maybe 20 years ago, on getting a measurable set from coin flipping, a non-measurable set, rather, from coin flipping, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I, I don't remember the, the author or the exact reference, but I, I remember once teaching our graduate measure theory class and and, and having the students uh, work through that paper. You have to have a lot of coins to do it. <laughs> yeah, of course, <laughs> or one or a very strong thumb. Ah, <laughs> oh, okay, everyone. Have a uh, enjoyable Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everybody, eat your turkey. No, I prefer duck. Duck. Ah. Yeah. Well. Okay. A little, little detour. Yeah. Yeah. I prefer turkey, even though uh, both of my kids are vegetarians. So we have to have a turkey plus a fish. Fortunately, they're piscatarian, so they will eat fish, but uh, they won't eat meat. Makes it very complicated. So uh, anyway, um, hopefully we'll all be back in two weeks. Uh, all, right. all right. Be well all. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh